Soon, Boris, it won't be a holographic image I hold in my hand. But the Earth is something. This is impossible. The gun shoots dust. I know you want to buy my stock. I just want to watch my soaps. What the heck's the big deal with this? Oh, hey, welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. Uh, the first of 2021. For those new to the series, this is where I tell you the story of a given artist as told through their principal discography. This month's artist was chosen by me, but next month's will be chosen by all of you via the Deep Discog Dive decision. In the description is a poll where you can vote on who you want to see covered. The poll will run for the next two weeks, so go check that out before it's too late. You're also welcome to leave comments suggesting who you'd like to see covered, and if you want to check out any of the tracks that I talk about today, there's a Spotify playlist in the description where you can check out all of them. For today's artist, I want to do something a little bit different and start at the ending. Last year, uh, New Year's Eve to be exact, the general public was shocked to learn of this artist's passing. Two months prior. I cannot tell you the amount of people I saw paying their respects to this man, and that outpouring of support and admiration inspired me to look at this hero of hip-hop. Or should I say, this villain. Today, we're talking about MF Doom. Let's dive in. Victor Von Doom and his father the next morning. 1971, the Apollo 14 launches, That's Disney World awesome. opens, and Daniel Dumoulin is born in London. Very early in his childhood, he and his family moved to Long Island, New York. It was there where he grew up, took an interest to in music and comics, and got the nickname Doom from his family, which was a play on his last name. His first album would come out in 1991, but I should lay down quickly that this dive is gonna work a little bit differently than usual. You see, if I wanted to be the cheekiest little cheek, I could say that the artist MF Doom only has two albums credited to his name. And I would technically be right. But not only am I one angry mob away from being evicted, I feel like that would be a grave disservice to this man's body of work. Part of Doom's artistic journey was his collaborations with other artists and the other aliases he would go by. As such, this dive is gonna be taking a look at any full-length project that he had a leading role on. So let's look at his first alias. In his late teens, Dumoulin, performing by the name Zev Love X, created the rap group KMD. Included in the group was his brother Dingilsway, also known as DJ Subrock, and Rodan. Their first recording was a guest feature on New York rap outfit Third Base's The Gas Face, which got them noticed by and signed to Electra Records. Soon after, Rodan left to finish high school, and Onyx the Birthstone Kid came in to replace him. Their first record as a trio was Mr. Hood released in May 1991. And I gotta say, Mr. Hood is Mr. Good. The production, handled by Zev and Subrock, isn't anything groundbreaking, but it is fun to hear them bring disparate elements together and make them work. One track, the trio is dropping lines about their black Muslim roots. The next, they're sampling Sesame Street. I also gotta say, the bass work on some of these songs is so tight and immediately gratifying, specifically on 808 Man and Trial and Error, like I dare you not to head bob to them, at the very least. Hearing these three guys pass the mic between each other is entertaining. Lead single Peach Fuzz is a great example. And already, the artist formerly known as Zev possessed confidence behind the mic. That said, these days, it's weird to hear him rap so on the beat. Actually, that observation doesn't make much sense at this point in time, but keep that in mind for later. So yeah, it wasn't like a record that lit up the rap world by any means, but if you're a fan of De La Soul or A Tribe Called Quest, that more conscious side of rap, I, I think you'll enjoy this. Look up Modest and Success in the dictionary, and you get Mr. and Hood respectively. KMD's first album made just enough impact and just enough money to get a second record greenlit by Elektra. After a tour supporting third base, the trio went back into the studio, gearing up to release Blick Bis Dirds in May 1994. Given their success up to this point, this record had the potential to be KMD's breakthrough. But I will remind the audience that all supervillains have an origin story, and this record represented Dumoulin's for two reasons. First, by May 1994, KMD had become a one-man show. Onyx left the group midway through recording sessions, and Subrock was tragically hit by a car and killed just as the album was nearing completion. Daniel was left on his own to finish the record, which he did, 
but that leads to the second reason. You might have noticed on this album's title card, I listed two different years for when it was released. And that's because Elektra refused to put the album out in 1994. The label had just gotten past a massive controversy with Ice-T's Cop Killer. The album cover had already created negative buzz stemming from a Billboard article, and Elektra promptly dropped the album off their release schedule. It wouldn't be properly released until 2001. And that means I should probably talk about the album now. It's good. As many groups do with their sophomore LP, the trio mined themselves for lyrical inspiration, violence, alcoholism, drugs, the general act of growing up. The production is more or less the same as it was on their first record, but the beats can sound a bit muddier by comparison on some tracks. Though once again, I gotta highlight the bass work on songs like Sweet Premium Wine, It Sounded Like a Rock, and Smoke in That. All in all, a fine second album. Now I'm not saying KMD could have been the next Doritos, Cheetos, or Fritos of popular rap music, and I'm not sure if this would have been the record to get them there, but their music was enjoyable, and it's really unfortunate that this was their final record. Dumoulin was left to reckon with the loss of a brother and the dissolution of his path to mainstream rap success, and he effectively disappeared from the public space. Until about 1997. It was that year when Dumoulin began making public appearances again with a bit of a twist. Doing his best Raising Arizona impression, he performed with tights over his head to obscure his identity. Eventually, he would replace the tights with a metal mask inspired by the film Gladiator and assume his new moniker, MF Doom. While the name came from his childhood nickname, the look of his metal face led many to connect him to Dr. Doom from Marvel's Fantastic Four, a connection that Doom wholeheartedly embraced in his music. The modern malefactor began playing open mics in Manhattan, sharing the stage with other underground acts like... Uh, this dude who raps about candy or something? The villain's proper debut to the world was Operation Doomsday, released in April 1999. And now's as good a time as any to talk about Doom's flow. This man can rhyme so fine on a dime, it's a crime. Doom has such a firm handle on the English language, and to hear him weave bars together, effortlessly hopping between rhyme schemes, is a feat that very few rappers can pull off. It's the kind of delivery that basically inspired those YouTube channels that break down and color code a rapper's verse, a stream of consciousness approach that all but requires a deeper analysis. You'll spend an hour going over Doom's verses to determine the exact way he's saying he's better than you. It was to my surprise then that Doom's production isn't really all that aggressive or in your face. At first, it feels off to hear Doom drop these tangled verses over, say, a James Ingram sample on Rhymes Like Dimes, or a Steely Dan sample on Gastrols. But the more you listen, the more this inhibited production makes sense in how it allows Doom to be heard on the mic. It's a case of vocals and production working so well in tandem, and it's an excellent introduction for Doom, both as a lyricist and producer. Between Doomsday and his next full-length record, Doom released the first volume of his Special Herbs tapes. These were instrumentals he made under his producing pseudonym, Metal Fingers, and he would release another nine volumes between 2001 and 2005. I'm not going to take the time to cover every single one in this video, but if you're a fan of Doom's production in any way, they're definitely worth checking out. In fact, some of the beats on these tapes are gonna pop up again on future Doom records. Also during this break, sometime in 2002, a friend introduced him to the work of West Coast label Stone's Throw and a certain producer on their roster but I'm gonna put a pin in that and come back to it later. Anyway, our next stop on the Doom Tour is... King Ghidorah, take me to your leader. Released in June 2003. This time, Doom performed under the alias of King Ghidorah, which he had previously debuted as part of the Monster Island Czars. He also handles all production on this thing, and my god, if you want the clearest example of why Doom's production is so great, this is it. A few seconds into opening track phasers with those beautiful strings, and I was hooked. Doom's intent with this project was to create an album that sounds like a giant three-headed dragon monster trying to craft a fire mixtape, and the results sear themselves into your brain like said dragon monster's laser breath. Doom is behind the board for much of the record, instead leaving most of the verses to other underground artists, and they're fine. 
they work. Honestly, none of the moments I remember off this album come from the verses. I remember the soaring guitars off Fastlane, the B-movie sound collages of the title track, and Monster Zero, the strings on I Wonder. It's an excellent album and one that I cannot recommend highly enough. It also kicked off a frankly astonishing run of albums for Doom between 2003 and 2005. Doom's next album was released just a few months later in September 2003. Vaudeville Villain works as a compliment to Take Me To Your Leader. Where his leader had Doom staying behind the board for most of its run, Vaudeville puts him on the mic, with production handled by mostly unknowns, and also RJD2. And with Doom mainly on the mic, he gets to debut yet another persona. This time, he performs as Victor Vaughn, a teenage drug dealer slash time traveler whose name is another Doctor Doom reference. The result is that Doom is able to focus solely on the words, and man, does he relish the opportunity. The title track sets up the character of Victor with one of the album's best beats. Modern day mugging has Doom teaching us how to rob, even though he almost gets killed by an old lady at the very end. Can I Watch has Victor and guest Apani B flirt back and forth before he goes and puts his foot in his mouth. Never Dead might be the album's masterpiece from a lyrical standpoint. Doom tells a story in which he time travels to enact revenge on some kids who stole his Donkey Kong game. Now, if this was Mickey's racing adventure for the Game Boy Color that got stolen, I would have let it go. But you steal Donkey Kong? Oh, it's over. It's over for you. And the production complements these stories so well. The producers here take the R&B, sample-heavy vibe from the past two records, but inject it with some electronic flourishes. It's the most futuristic Doom has ever sounded, and it still sounds fresh to this day. Definitely check this out. If Operation Doomsday established the man that was MF Doom, then Take Me to Your Leader and Vaudeville Villain established the myth. And that just leaves the legend. Let me go back to that pin from earlier. Like I said, in 2002, a friend of Doom introduced him to Stone's Throw and their most well-known artist, Madlib, who was a big fan of Operation Doomsday. After hearing Madlib's work, Doom decided to fly out to the West Coast to work with him. The resulting sessions were nothing short of... Madlib ended up creating hundreds of beats, some with Doom in person, and some after their meetup while he was touring in Brazil. It was here that, unfortunately, the unfinished album was stolen and leaked onto the internet. The two then broke off to work on other projects. Madlib worked on a Blue Notes remix album and a collab album with Jay Dilla. Doom worked on the two records I just covered. They eventually reconvened to finish up the record, and by this point, a whole lot of people had heard the leak and were excited to hear this new album. And hear it they did, in March 2004, specifically, the finished album was Mad Villainy, credited to the supervillain duo Mad Vill Oh my god, this thing is so good. I know it's cliche, I know it's the one that everybody loves, but god damn it, there's a reason for that, and it's because this album is spectacular. I'm gonna start a new religion, and its primary text is Mad Villainy. Not only is Madlib a kindred spirit to Doom and how they're both crate diggers, but his beats are utterly perfect for Doom's flow. The beats are always slightly off-tempo, and Doom's bars are also slightly off-tempo. You'd think that'd be disorienting, but the two have such a strong chemistry that they work in perfect harmony. What's more, when they met up to finish the record, Doom re-recorded all of his vocals to have a deeper, husky tone. It gives his performance a distinction and character that no other record of his has. This record is a masterpiece of cohesion, and as such, I feel weird telling you to check out any one track or moment because they each flow into each other so well, but I'm gonna do my best. First track Accordion has such a perfectly off-kilter beat to kick off the album, plus Doom drops about five bars that would be any other rapper's best lines ever. Meat Grinder features Doom spinning this intricate yarn about a girl he likes over one of the most lurid sounding beats on the whole album. Bistro establishes the atmosphere of the record. It has Doom pretending he's opening a restaurant with all the album's collaborators. Mad villain, bistro, bed and breakfast, bar, grill, cafe, lounge on the water. Right this way, everyone. Free puppies, ginger snaps, pocket PCs. Fancy Clown has this guy calling his girlfriend and ripping her a new one for cheating on him with Doom. And the guy happens to be Victor Vaughn, so it's really just Doom bashing on Doom. The piano sample on all caps. God, that part in the left hand at the start is such an excellent way to build hype.
The beat off Great Day is just a Stevie Wonder instrumental pitched up, but it sounds so good. And the track also happens to have one of my favorite stanzas of any song. Last wish, I wish I had two more wishes, and I wish they fixed the door to the Matrix's mad glitches. Spit so many verses, some time my jaw twitches. One thing this party could use is more. <laughs> yourself in your own shoes. It's just all so good. It is inhumanly good. And if you have not heard this yet, please do as soon as possible. Doom's next album following Mad Villainy was a proper return to his Victor Vaughn character. Just about six months after his breakout, VV2 Venomous Villain was released. Hey Doom, what do you think of this album? Dub it off your man, don't spend that 10 bucks. I did it for the advance, the back end sucks. Yeah, Better yeah, that's about right. I said earlier that Doom was in a very prolific phase during this time, but Venomous Villain is the sole weak spot from this phase. Like on Vaudeville Villain, Doom only raps on this, with beats being handled by other producers. Unlike Vaudeville Villain, the beats aren't all that memorable. Apparently, Doom selected producers for this through a raffle, and the overall tone of the record feels slapdash as a result. What's more, Doom himself is absent for a lot of it. The Pitchfork review of this album said he appears for less than a third of its total runtime. He felt more present on Take Me To Your Leader, an album where he was behind the board for most of it. Are there any tracks I'd recommend? Uh, uh, this one with Cool Keith? That, that one was all right. Aside from that one song though, this record's not crucial to enjoying Doom. But the next record we're gonna talk about though was an unexpected turn amid a career full of unexpected turns. Doom became a foodie. Doom's next project was only his second under the name MF Doom. Mm Food, released in November 2004, is all about food. He's just like Bon Appetit in that way, and in literally no others. I mean, it's also about other things, but Doom always brings it back to food. It's like the question he tried to answer when writing each track was, how can I tie this to the McDonald's menu? And just like McDonald's, Doom handles a good chunk of the production, though Mad Lib does pop up for one beer, which was actually an outtake from Mad Villainy. The beat on Ho Cakes is just... <laughs> with a winning combination of J.J. Fad and Anita Baker samples. He even throws on some beatboxing. That's neat. He's just like my college acapella group in that way, and in literally no other. Also, I don't know if this is a hot take, but I enjoyed the four instrumental skits in the middle of the album. They reminded me of the sound collages off Take Me To Your Leader, though I do wish they weren't all in a row. And lyrically, Doom continues to operate on a whole other level. This album is basically an excuse for Doom to put skilled with food-based double entendres on his resume. Opener Beef Rap lays out Doom's disinterest with starting beef with other artists. Rap snitch Niches sees Doom and Mr. Fantastic rail against artists who confess to crimes in their own songs, with, can I just say, a phenomenal beat from Doom's Special Herb series. Tracks like Deep Fried Friends and Concarne show a more intimate side of the villain, the latter especially, it's a tribute to his late brother. It's a remarkably unpretentious album, one that sets out to do a thing and does it better than anyone else could have. Excellent stuff. Between M mm Food and the next record, Doom popped up as a guest on a few tracks, the most notable being his spot on November Has Come off Gorilla's Demon Days, a record that was produced by Danger Mouse. This was about a year after his Grey Album mashup project and a year before Gnarls Barkley. Here we had two men who were relatively fresh off career-defining projects, and they teamed up as Danger Doom for The Mouse and The Mask, released in October 2005. And the two are joined by an impressive array of guests, Ghostface Killa, Talib Kweli, Yo, uh, Danger! It's me, your old buddy, Shake! Master Shake? From... Aqua Teen Hunger Force? Okay, I haven't mentioned this yet, but this whole record is low-key an advertisement for Adult Swim. They were the ones who got MF Mouse together in the first place, and characters from many of their shows pop up here. Two songs on here are outright based on Adult Swim shows. Perfect Hair is about a show called Perfect Hair Forever, which Doom actually starred in as a giraffe, and Aqua Teen Hunger Force is about... Moral oral? And while it's neat in theory and occasionally in practice, the Adult Swim connection leads to a juvenile streak that runs through the album. For example, Sofa King has a great beat, but it's based on an Aqua Teen joke that reeks of 2000s middle school humor. You could make the case that that works in tandem with MF Doom's cartoonish side, but I wasn't a huge fan. But the humor isn't enough to sour Doom's intricate wordplay, and Danger Mouse's production is top-notch throughout. I loved the two Keith Mansfield orchestra samples on Old School 
Rules, and Space Hose. I'll also highlight Ghostface Killa being on this record because of the reports that Doom and Ghost had been working on an album together called Doom Starks. The album unfortunately never released, but their working relationship would continue for the next 15 years. Even with its warts, The Mouse and the Mask is still an enjoyable ride, and it concludes MF Doom's spectacular run of albums and also Venomous Villain in the mid-2000s. It would be another four years before we'd see Doom on a full-length project again. That four-year period was fairly quiet for Doom, at least compared to his run from 03 to 05. He was a guest on a couple of tracks. I'll shout out his spot with Ghostface on the main theme for Grand Theft Auto Chinatown Wars, if only because it was the first of many tracks he would do for the game series. We also got an EP follow-up to The Mouse and the Mask called Occult Hymns, plus Mad Villainy 2! which was just a remix album done by Mad Lib. Yeah, rumors had been swirling and would continue to swirl about a proper Mad Villainy sequel, but it unfortunately never came out. But you know what did come out? Sneakers! The MF Doom Nike SB Dunk High was released in 2007 as a collab between Doom and Nike, and it answers the age-old question, what if Doom was a shoe? If you're curious, the pair of shoes usually retail these days for about... Ah! But MF Doom, or rather just Doom this time, made his grand return to the scene with Born Like This, released in March 2009. And right off the bat, Something feels a bit different about this one. Doom still raps in his usual twisted and twisty way. Production is mostly done by Doom, though we do get beats from Mad Lib and the late Jay Dilla. We get samples from Roger Rabbit and Mr. T, but also Charles Bukowski. Hospitals, which are so expensive that it's cheaper to- The album itself is named after one of his poems. And overall, the tone of this record is darker than anything Doom has done before. If his past records were explorations of villainy, Born Like This is an exploration of evil. This means Doom gets to explore his own psyche and persona, which can be really captivating. He brings a razor sharpness to tracks like Gazillion Ear and Angels. Plus, I gotta shout out That's That, which might be the most layered, dense set of lyrics Doom ever wrote. Trees is free, please leave a key. These meager fleas, he's the breeze and she's the bee's knees for she's. So on one hand, this darker turn yields some of Doom's most fascinating work. On the other hand, you get a track like... So the alleged story behind this track is that Doom's son said Batman was cooler than Doom. That could be an interesting basis for a track, especially considering Doom's villainous persona. So what does he do? He writes a song about how Batman and a bunch of other superheroes are gay. I'm not selling it short, that, that is it, that's the joke of the song. That's it. Now, Doom spoke about this track as yet another reinforcement of his villainous character. That said, I don't think it's aged well in the slightest, and I would rather just listen to all of the other tracks where Doom's being a villain. Hey, another thing, why are Doom's vocals so distorted on many of these songs? I'd get it if the production was similarly grainy, but the production sounds super clean and modern, and it takes me out of the experience to hear what I think is Doom clipping in the mix. It also doesn't really end that strongly. After the underground posse cuts supervillains, the next three tracks are all shorter than two minutes, and the last two are instrumentals. Solid instrumentals, but it just kind of feels like the album ends because it has to at some point. But even though this one does have its shortcomings, I respect the more personal take on the supervillain, and I understand why some people are especially fond of this one. Doom spent most of 2010 touring for Born Like This, first in North America and then in the UK. And as he was wrapping up the UK leg of the tour, he was delighted to find out he was barred from re-entering the US. Did I say delighted? I meant pissed. Okay, so turns out I have indeed been the cheekiest little cheek because I didn't tell you the full story at the start of this dive. You see, while Doom did indeed move to the US at a young age and lived there for most of his life, he never actually became a legal citizen. And so Doom was unfairly stranded in the UK, an ocean away from his wife and child. It would be another two years before they'd move across the pond to be with him. In the interim, he based himself in London, and his next project tapped into his disillusionment surrounding the situation, Key to the Cuffs, credited to JJ Doom, released in August 2012. Producing duties this time went to Gennaro Jarrell, a New Orleans-based producer. He and Doom would send each other beats and bars over the World Wide Web. Jarrell's production falls in line with Doom's past work, yet these beats are the most electronic-sounding Doom's rapped over since 
vaudeville villain? That in and of itself is enough to separate Cuffs from the rest of Doom's discography, but what's more, he and Jarrell, along with guests like Damon Albarn and Beth Gibbons, create this laid-back atmosphere for most of the record. Doom still spits as well as he ever has, but his delivery is often weary and guttural, closer to his delivery on Mad Villainy. That same weariness means that this record doesn't jump out in any way, it tends to just stay in its own lane. Tracks like Governor and Winter Blues are highlights on their own, and any track with this line Catch a throat full from the fire vocal with ash and molten glass like I am is worthy of praise, but the rest is underwhelming, but not in a bad way. I, I think this record captures the exact mood and feeling it wants to, I just also think that said mood is hazy and understated and doesn't make much of an impact. Granted, I think knowing about this record's backstory has made me a little more sympathetic to it. I do think it is worth checking out, in part because of the history and in part because it is good, but I can't guarantee that you specifically will enjoy it. The next record in the Doomcography saw him back on primary producing duties, handing the mic over to newcomer Bishop Nehru. They collaborated under the name Nehruvian Doom, which also happens to be the name of their album released in October 2014. Doom does pop up every so often for a verse. Highlight Great Things actually has him imparting wisdom to young Bishop, but Nehru is the one we hear the most. And he handles the mic well. At first I was kinda underwhelmed by him, but then I learned he was 15 when this album dropped. As one former 15 year old to another, I gotta respect. You can clearly tell that Nehru was inspired by rappers like Doom, and to have both the old and new guard team up is pretty sweet. The only thing going against this record is that, like Keys to the Cuff, it stays firmly in its lane. The production by Doom is good, I didn't dislike any beat on here, but it's the same sonic vibe he nailed back in the 2000s. And by this point in my listening for this video, I was starting to get tired of it. Still, that's more of an acknowledgement of where I was personally, and if that vibe is what you want, this will deliver it for you. Between 2014 and 2017, Doom could once again be found hopping on other artists' tracks. The one I want to highlight, and one of my favorite Doom appearances, is Frankie Sinatra off the Avalanche's comeback album, Wildflower. Hearing him and Danny Brown on a track together is a treat. It really makes me wish we got more collabs between Doom and the Avalanches. Duma Lanches? Anyway, his next full-length collaboration was with Zarface, a rap outfit made up of Wu-Tang's Inspecta Deck and producers 7L and Esoteric. On the production end, the duo style is perfect for Doom. It's the exact kind of 90s throwback sampling that Doom himself became famous from. Tracks like Bomb Throne and Nautical Depth are production highlights. I was also impressed by Inspecta Deck, particularly on Metal with Metal and Astral Traveling. I'm a modern day Gil Scott Heron. You know who else is really good on this? Open Mike Eagle on Phantoms. Just listen to the way he starts his verse. My father goes to my apartment, he had too many hit points. He best have been told me I should have invested in Bitcoin. You can't not love this. You might have noticed I haven't mentioned Doom's presence on this so far, and that's because he's fine. He doesn't drop any duds, but there aren't any classic lines by him on this one. He does his thing, and his thing he does. I'm not gonna pretend like this album reinvents the rap wheel, or that it's some groundbreaking project like Mad Villainy was, but if what you want is some solid rap that harkens back to the golden 90s, this'll definitely do the trick. The only real disappointing thing about this album is that it ended up being Doom's last studio record. Out! I have no time for you. Okay. Doom popped up on a couple more tracks after the Zarface collab. The most recent tracks were from last year for Grand Theft Auto Online, one with Flying Lotus and one with Bad Bad Not Good. Which, man, beggars can't be choosers, but imagine if we got records with Doom where Flying Lotus was behind the board or if Bad Bad Not Good was the backing band. Just, God, imagine. It would have been so cool. And then we got the news on New Year's Eve 2020 a post on social media from his wife saying that he had passed away on October 31st that same year. There haven't been any posthumous releases from his estate so far. I think the last time he was referenced in pop culture was when Kylie Jenner wore the Doom Nikes at one point. But uh, yeah, that's that's been it. To be honest, I've been thinking a lot about MF Doom's death recently because uh, about a week before filming this, we lost another massive musician, uh, producer Sophie. And aside from the fact that they both left us far, far too soon, the one thing that connects them both in my mind is their monumental impact on the scenes they were a part of. 
even if you had never heard a song by them before, you probably listened to an artist who was in some way shaped by one of these musicians. And to be even more honest, there's a part of me that wishes that KMD was able to survive and that Doom might have been able to enjoy some other kind of success, one that was unencumbered by the pain that spurred his villainous transformation. But considering the circumstances, I am very thankful for the music he did give us, and I am all but certain that his name will be remembered for years to come. Just remember, all caps when you spell the man's name. If you want to get into MF Doom, Matt Villainy should absolutely be your first listen. And then Operation Doomsday, Take Me to Your Leader, and Vaudeville Villain uh, to follow up. And if you have a favorite MF Doom song or album or beat or verse or related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments. Again, the poll for next month's dive is in the description, so go check that out if you want to say in who I cover, and be sure to check out the Spotify playlist too. Thanks for watching, and let me see if I can get back to my soaps. What is happening to this gun?